Welcome to the Conversations That Matter podcast parking lot edition. Uh, I wasn't in a good position to uh, do the podcast from my my desk today, and I wanted to get some information out to you, so I decided to use my new uh, Canon Rebel, which I just purchased. Thank you, patrons. This is something that I've wanted to get for a while to do side projects, and I already have some lined up uh, for interviews um, that are going to be a little higher quality, so uh, I appreciate that. But uh, we're, we're testing out today. I, I don't have the, my, the microphone yet that I want to get, but we're going to test out the internal mic on this thing, I guess. Um, I do have some important things. I'm going to splice in uh, some video and some um, some screenshots later. We're going to talk about uh, election integrity a little bit. We're going to talk about the SBC and some things going on there. We're going to make some uh, announcements uh, and really there's some practical things you can do. People ask me sometimes, what can I do? And I'm going to tell you, here's some things you can do where you are. Uh, you know, everyone's different, but here's some practical things for you. And then a devotional thought, sort of. I, I guess more of a, we're, we're just going to read Luke 11, part of it. And just very simple reading. I'm not going into analysis other than I might tell you kind of where I see this being applied today, more or less. And uh, and you can see if I'm I'm right about that or, or see see if you see, um, this is where Jesus is saying woe to the Pharisees. See, see if you see these same characteristics uh, in the um, evangelical industrial complex, as I call it. Uh, so... Uh, first, election integrity. That's the first topic. Let's uh, let me just give you a few headlines and some resources uh, because I think this is an important issue. It, we got it. You know, what's the use, John? The election's over. Well, um, the, you see how much energy is being expended to censor anyone who says fraud took place. That's because it matters. That's because. Um, if they can successfully do this, which it seems like they are, if they can successfully censor people and make them out to be uh, violent or you know they need to be canceled if they think fraud happened, uh, then um, essentially they, they get to win every election from here on out by not even winning the election, but by manipulating it. That's I think that's what's going on essentially. This is this is a revolution. Um, it's, not, it's not the people on the 6th. I, I, I keep saying that. It's not. That wasn't an insurrection, revolution, whatever you want to call it. It's what happened on the 7th. It's what's been taking place now for a few months. Um, really, you could almost say since COVID started. Um, and so, and by the way, we're going to have some stuff on more. I'm, I'm going to put out some things on masks and other stuff uh, as well, but uh, not in this episode. In this episode, we're going to talk about election integrity in the SBC. Um, so election integrity is important. It is important that we keep this issue alive and whoever runs in 2024 uh, is going to need to be, that they're going to have to campaign on this. This is going to have to be in something that they're aggressively pursuing. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you why. Um, first of all, I don't know if you, you saw, this is just sort of a tangent, but Miramar, uh, there's a military coup there and there's it's over election fraud we don't know exactly at least publicly it's not available that i could find uh, i don't know exactly what happened um but apparently there are reports going to come out the military is going to release something and we'll find out what's going on hopefully uh, in greater detail but there's some questions about did what happened in miramar was that uh the same kind of thing that happened in the united states i don't know we'll find out but more importantly, and this is why I said what I just said about um, 2024, Patrick Byrne, former CEO of Overstock.com, businessman, he's got nothing to gain, everything to lose by coming forward. He has come forward with an excellent four-part series on how the Donald Trump team, the White House team, the legal team, lost the election. And it is eye-opening and jaw-dropping. The um, And I, I, have, I had a high confidence in Patrick Byrne long before he put this out. Uh, I, I I have a, a certain level of trust for him. Like I said, he's got he's got nothing to to, to gain in any of this, and everything to lose. Uh, and he 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 just comes across as an honest guy who cares about election integrity. This isn't wasn't even his like main issue, but um, he he worked with uh, Sidney Powell, General Flynn, to some extent, and he gives a very eye opening insiders kind of critique and just just, just tells a story about what happened, and it is just. I don't even have words for it. The level of incompetence was off the charts uh, for the Ru Rudy Giuliani, Jenna Ellis team. And some of this, I think some of us suspected. I suspected it with Rudy uh, to some extent. So something just seemed off. And Patrick Byrne confirms all this. Here's the encouraging part. I would encourage you, please, the link is in the info section. Go read it. And while you're being discouraged by reading how bad it was, realize that if you had someone running who wanted to 
uh, be efficient and do like maybe like what Michael Flynn was trying to do and create a team for election integrity, you might be able to do it. You really might be able to do it if you just had someone who had leadership and competence. Uh, and so that's the encouraging thing. Uh, now, I, I still think it's a slim chance that the, that a conservative, a true conservative, or even just someone who wants to stop the the onslaught of the the Great Reset, I, I think it's a slim chance that person can win the White House again. But um, but but look, th the crazier things have happened, and um, and I, I think it's going to be necessary. Whoever does, they're going to have to understand exactly what happened in the, this particular election. And Patrick Byrne lays it out. So go read that, um, and let's keep this issue alive. Uh, some so that's encouraging. Mike Lindell also put out a two-hour video. He's being censored off YouTube. You can find the link in the info section. It's on Rumble. Uh, two-hour video giving 100% proof. I'd say this is more working class level. Um, I, if someone's more visual and working class, send this to them. But it's got especially an amazing part, kind of three quarters of the way through, where there's a map of all the places that servers from China were accessing. Um, the election, the Dominion machines in uh, Georgia and Michigan, etc. Uh, so that that is fascinating. Uh, please check that out. I, I I just put it on double speed while I was at the gym. I listened to most of it, and you know I know it's daunting, two hours, but you know just take a little time. And uh, and the censorship is real right now against people like Mike Lindell, like Patrick Byrne. Mike Lindell uh, lost has lost a lot of contracts with people that were selling his products, advertisers. Uh, he's not on Twitter anymore because they took him off. They took his business off Twitter. He is being attacked viciously. Go buy some nightwear. Go buy some pillows. Please do something. Go to MyPillow.com. Support the guy in some way. Uh, I would just encourage you to do that. Um, and the people he's working for. They're getting hurt by all the censorship as well. So I encourage you to support him. Uh, in the Southern Baptist Convention, that's our second topic. I, I want to talk about some things that are going on. There's a few controversies. I think, if I'm getting my sequence right, I think it all kicked off uh, about a week ago. There was an ERLC audit, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, Russell Moore's group. That was put out. And in this particular audit, um, I, I skimmed it. Essentially, it seems to be saying that you know the ERLC is... There's mission drift. It's not serving the purpose Southern Baptists have it there. I think I would have been more aggressive. Uh, step in the right direction, though, okay? And and this was from the e, um, SBC Executive Committee. Well, um, the, it seemed, I think it's right after this that all of a sudden we have a bunch of controversies. Uh, one is this Jezebel controversy. And I'm going to give you just – here's a few things that you can, um, you can look at. Uh, one is J.D. Greer, president of the convention. And I'm, I'm going to sort of set this up. Um, it really comes, basically, Tom Buck, pastor who's more conservative in the convention, used the word Jezebel to describe Kamala Harris. J.D. Greer says, I realize that some pastors are likely unaware of the history of certain racial stereotypes in calling uh, the vice president Jezebel. Uh, that doesn't make it less unwise. There are times we will critique policies that should not include personal attacks on a newly elected official God has told us to honor and pray for. Um, notice how he said new elected official. Notice how, how Greer snuck that in there. Isn't that interesting how they're all on board with that? Let us speak clearly and boldly for righteousness, but in a way that honors what the scripture says about honoring our leaders. We don't correct one sin through another. So he's saying it's sin. That is the insinuation. Uh, Tom Buck is in sin for calling Kamala Harris a Jezebel. Now, Think about all the things going on right now. Think about everything that's going on. I mean, it, there's 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 so much. You, we, you could talk about what's happening um, on uh, the the Wall Street, the Robin Hood thing. You could talk about uh, what's going on on. The, I mean, the cancel culture is through the roof right now. We've never seen anything like this. Uh, you could talk about the election integrity issue. Uh, you could talk about um, you know some of the, the shakeups going on in, in Congress right now in the Senate. Uh, there, I mean, it's kind of troubling to, to me to see what happened to um, uh, Congressman Green. Uh, I think it's Green, who uh, you know she she had posted some things. I guess years ago, she doesn't believe this anymore. But years ago, she had posted some things. Uh, I I don't follow QAnon or I don't know a lot about that stuff. But I guess she had posted some things from that, and they're taking away her committee um, seat uh, participant, whatever committee she was on. They're taking that away from her because of that, which, you know, you think about some of the other things people have said in Congress, the hypocrisy is through the roof here. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on about all the things, like, you know, boys tr trouncing girls 
in women's track meets. And now this is part of civil rights policy. I mean, so many things. And, and the sense of proportion just to me, is just amazing. It's so off um, that this is such a concern that someone said Jezebel about. So, <laughs> so that's where the president, that's the president of the Southern Baptist Convention right now saying that. There was an article that came out. Uh, this is in the Dallas News, and I guess the Associated Press contributed to this. And I'll, um, I'll, I'm going to circle back to this uh, our, our, uh, article later to take a phrase, circle back. That's a phrase that we hear a lot now from our press secretary, right? Um, um, <laughs> I, just, I just realized that when I said it. So I, I wasn't trying to copy her. I did use that term before. But anyway, in this particular article, and I'll, I'll just give you the headline, uh, it's Arlington Pastor Dwight McKissick receives racist letter after leaving Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. And I'm going to tell you a little more about that. But first, let me kind of scroll to the end here. He, what This issue gets tacked on. He says um, that uh, using the term Jezebel is basically unacceptable. Um, and... In the article, okay, so here, here's the funny thing. At the end of the article, it says that in a 2015 blog post, McKissick himself used the term in a blog post about a black pastor in a same-sex marriage. So McKissick is, is bent out of shape that some conservative SBC pastors use the word Jezebel to describe Kamala Harris, and he used the term in 2015. He's justifying it because he says, well, that was a theological issue, and they're using it about a political issue. How do you know that? And why assume it's racist? I mean, was it racist when he used it? When you know, that This is the double standard, guys. This is why we, we just can't take these people seriously. That's honestly the bottom line. You just can't take them seriously. They're, they're hip hypocrites of the highest order, and they don't believe what they're saying. If it really was this racial stereotype, he wouldn't use it. But he used it. <laughs> And now he's justifying him using it because it's theological. That has nothing, no impact on whether or not it's racially offensive, right? Um, so, so this is just, it's wrong for you to do it, but it's fine for me to do it type stuff. And, and I think the conservative pastors that said this, they're not, they are thinking theologically. They're, because because politics and the, we're, we're dealing with a political religion. Politics and theology are so intertwined now because the left um, basically has their own social justice religion. All right. So I just, I just want to touch on that, and, and some people are getting bent out of shape about this. I, I don't, to me, I, I just kind of, when I saw it, I was like, eh, man, what, it, like, so what else is new? Why are we taking this seriously? And we, we just shouldn't. There's no reason to take it seriously. Um, so the, with this, at the same time, there's a letter that was released. Uh, I guess Dwight McKissick released it, or someone connected to him, that he received... And I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some screenshots here, um, and it, it it is very offensive, by the way. Uh, it, this I mean I don't I haven't seen one person who has said, oh that's a perfectly fine letter. No one thinks that. Um, it's let's see if I can find. So so the first person I saw post this is a guy named David Bumgardner, and he says this unspeakably racist letter was sent to Pastor McKissick after the Baptist Standard reported that he was leaving the SBTC. So the Baptist, uh, that, that's the, I guess, the association down there in Texas, uh, Texas Convention. And it says, tell me this war on CRT has nothing to do with race. Tell me. Again, again, it's just about scriptural fidelity. And you read the letter, and this guy uses some archaic language to describe um, uh, black people. And, you know, basically says that they're, I'm just sum, summing it up. I'm not going to read. It's kind of just, it's waste of time in my opinion. But um, basically they're, they're substandard. They're, they're kind of, uh, he doesn't, I don't know if he says they're animals, but he kind of insinuates that. So it's a terrible thing for him to write, uh, whoever this guy is. Well, his name is John Rutledge. And I, I'll, I kid you not, I did five minutes. It only took me five minutes. I'm like, okay, who's John Rutledge? Because this is being portrayed as, oh, this is, this is a, about the war on CRT. I'm like, well, is that really what he's talking about? Is this the war on CRT? Found out he's a Darwinist. He's a huge Richard Dawkins fan. Uh, he doesn't believe in the stories of creation, the Tower of Babel, or Noah. Uh, and that was, that was like 60 seconds with Google got me that. Um, it's not from a conservative Christian fighting critical race theory, CRT. Uh, it, it actually is more like a progressive from 1970. This guy is, he's a modernist. He, he would fit in with like the progressives of like 50 years ago. 
uh, 60 years ago, 100 years ago. Like that That's kind of where he's coming from. And he, he's not part of the Southern Baptist Convention. He left it a while ago. He doesn't believe in inerrancy. He doesn't, he's not a Christian. <laughs> he doesn't believe in the core doc, some of the core doctrines that Christians uh, believe. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's what I'm getting with a, just a very, you know, short search. And, and so the way it's being portrayed, this is being used for political purposes. This is being used to smear any conservative within the convention. You're just like John Rutledge. Really? Because John Rutledge is left the SBC, and part of the reason is he thinks it's too conservative. The guy's a progressive. Uh, they're making it out like, nah, he, he's just like Tom Buck. He's just like, he's just like Tom Askell, you know? Like, really? Really? That, that's who John Rutledge is? Um, so Ryan Abernathy uh, posted, th this is the, <laughs> I, I can't make this up, the, the, the letter that D Dwight McKissick got, this is the kind of thing our brothers and sisters of color go through every day while white Christians tell them to move along and get over it and it doesn't exist, racism doesn't exist, fuels my righteous anger, this is demonic and so is denying it. No, that's a straw man is what that is. And here's the thing, who says that racism doesn't exist? See, this is the fast. This is the thing they do. They it's it's they play fast and loose with these definitions. They'll they'll talk about racism and systemic racism in the same breath, like they're the same thing. They're connected. And then if a conservative comes out and says, "Wait, what evidence do you have that there's systemic racism in whatever institution, the police or whatever?" and they'll say, "Well, you know, uh, they don't have any, or they have just um, these stories. You know, look what happened to George Floyd. You know, but you start getting into numbers. You start trying to talk facts. You say well, there there isn't any evidence that anything's systemic going on here. You can't point me to the law. You can point me to some some cases here and there. Possibly, maybe. Usually, they're disputed, and that doesn't give you systemic." And then they'll say, what well, you're saying, racism doesn't exist. This is a bait and switch we see all the time. And it's happening here again with this Ryan Abernathy guy. He's saying, you know, he, you know Christians are telling black people that racism doesn't exist and to get over it. Really? Because I don't say that. Who says that? We're very careful. We say systemic racism. We say racism uh, like, like the kind that existed 60 years ago, 70 years ago. That kind of racism has, uh, I would never say it doesn't exist, but it's been greatly reduced. And that the people are over, they're exaggerating it for political purposes, certainly. I do believe that. And I think we can, it's easy to, with statistics, with polls that have been taken, with just living in a common sense fashion, I think you can pretty much see that, that that's true. It's been reduced. The social justice people are the ones that are obsessed with race and they're bringing back racism. And I think what they're doing is racist. So racism does exist. But, um, but to take this letter uh, from from uh, this guy John Rutledge, and then to make it out like, well, that's just uh, you know what, th this is like what black people go through every day. Really, every day you're getting letters like that, it's basically insinuating because you're black you're an animal. You should see some of the things I get, guys, in, in my inbox. I don't share a lot of that stuff. I mean, I, I just don't understand what how they get away with this, but they do. This lie persists. Um, Ryan Abernathy says, next time someone in the SBC tells you racism is over and we need to move on, show them this letter in the SBC. Why is this? So, again, John Rutledge is not in the SBC. So, this is, <laughs> it's a terrible letter. It, I condemn it. I think everyone condemns it that's seen it. But this doesn't, this isn't really representing anyone in the SBC who's conservative or really, John Rutledge represents John Rutledge. And there's probably some other people who feel the same way that we, most of us, um, will probably not on a regular basis meet. So um, they're they're ex they're exploiting this for political purposes. Uh, Anthony Bradley, this letter proves why Charlie Dates was right to leave the SBC. It proves why Eric Mason, Lecrae, etc., were right to publicly disassociate from evangelicalism. It is a culture of conservative evangelicalism, and until it Nehemiah nines itself, it has no business judging critical race theory at all. So he's saying basically you can't judge critical race theory because of this letter. Because this is what evangelicalism is. This is what the Southern Baptists are. Except John Rutledge isn't an evangelical, and he's not a Southern Baptist. So what's your point, Anthony Bradley? This is this guy who's supposed to be an academic. This is shoddy as as you can get. Um, Dwight McKissick uh, <laughs> retweets that, I and mean, he's the one that received the letter. He retweets it. He he's taking it that way. Um, 
The notion of the Southern Baptist Convention critiquing critical race theory with its racial house historically and currently out of order is a huge credibility problem. What? Histo so, okay, let me ask you this. The Southern Baptist Convention uh, had, had racists in it. Just, just like, you know, most of um, um, the United States, most of the world, uh, 100 years ago, had views on race which today would be considered completely wrong and, and just uh, terrible, you know, etc. Should the Southern Baptist Convention then eternally n never be allowed to critique critical race theory because of his, their racial house isn't historically in order? How, you can't change history. So what is, I mean, that's like saying, um, you know, a father who, uh, let's say, slept around before you know in his younger years he he i don't know che cheated once on his wife or something did something horrible repented of it doesn't do it anymore um but then his daughter or his son is is becoming his, his child is becoming transgender or something uh or or he, ha he his child is a pedophile or what whatever the, the the sexually deviant thing that they're doing does the father then have no um responsibility or no ability to confront that because well his his house is historically out of order because he did something once years ago that's ridiculous you know you confess it you move on and then you correct this is a way for uh progressives in the convention to handcuff anyone who would critique critical race theory they're gonna f put this letter in their face so, well you're just like him no no, we're, we're, we're not actually. And in fact, that guy is more of a, like a Darwinist progressive. He's not even looking at uh, race the same way that we would look at race, that the Bible looks at race. So, you know, good luck with that. Um, that's what they're trying to do though. So here's another, I forget what publication this was, but it was a uh, racist letter sent to black pastor condemned as vile, sick, and disgusting. A racist letter sent to a prominent black pastor drew swift condemnation from the SBC leaders while further highlighting elevated racial tensions within the convention. John Rutledge isn't in the convention, guys. Uh, so, <laughs> that's that. Um, that... So, so those are just some things going on in the SBC. Uh, one other thing I wanted to, to just let you know about is um, the Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary had James White, different James White, not the one you're thinking of, uh, in chapel. And uh, here's just one clip of what he said. I hope this is a generation that doesn't get distracted. See, I serve a Christ that I can talk correctly about the history and reality of who we are as black people and white people. I serve a Jesus to where we can talk correctly about the injustices that's been done to the black church. I serve, see, you gotta understand, I'm even dressed that way today because understand something, from the top up, I'm dressed for the conservatives. From the top up, I'm dressed for you. From the bottom down, I got on my jeans because I'm ready to do some work. And I got on my boots too. And I wear a bow tie as a reminder that I tied this myself. And by tying it myself, my neck will not hang from anybody's rope anymore because I'm afraid of what I might say that there's a possibility of lynching because black men often had to say those things and their speech was relegated often. By, but my speech will not be relegated. I tied this myself this morning. And I have to wear that to remind me of speaking truth. So that was recently, uh, in this week, in chapel at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Yet we are continually told Southeastern is not going woke. They're uh, they're not you know they're they're orthodox as can be, um, not liberal in any way. I mean, you you tell me what what is this sound? What what's the point of that? You listen to the whole thing. It's not a sermon, guys. If you, I mean, if that's what you're giving your students as, here's how to preach, um, you know, we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. Uh, Danny Aiken also um, is the president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, for the, those who don't know. He posted earlier this week uh, a, a, 
article from Christianity Today. What is Christian nationalism? Christianity Today, very helpful article. Excellent distinction between being a patriot and a nationalist. I love my country, but the family of God transcends all earthly relationships and loyalties. And I think that last sentence gives you an insight into kind of what's going on here. Um, the kingdom of God is being used. E the eternal identity of Christians, the heaven, these things are being used to then um, get rid of, wash away, uh, kind of downplay the responsibilities and identities we have in the temporal realm. Uh, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a pastor, I'm a uh, businessman, I'm a, you know, whatever, you, you know, all the hats that you guys wear out there. Um, you know, think think about those things. Think about the allegiances you have. You know, you're a member of a family. You're a member of a church. You're a member of a community organization. You have a, a business or um, all these things mean something. You're, you're a member of a civil society. You have certain responsibilities because of that. Your local community. So uh, those things aren't just, yeah, yeah of course, uh, our, our primary uh, citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Absolutely. That doesn't mean we don't have allegiances and attachments down here uh, that God has even given us laws about to by which to follow. And I think that's part of the, the problem here with this Christian nationalism thing. The people who criticize it, um, they're, they're playing into the hands of globalists, first of all. But they're doing so um, because um, they're using this theology that... Uh, basically says that it, it's wrong to be like too, I guess, into your nation or too into your what fill in the blank. Um, I mean, you, you have these articles from like Gospel Coalition about how like marriage could be idolatry or family could be idolatry, like everything's idolatry. And, and so then they use that because the, it's not a sin to like really love your country, right? It's not a sin to, to love, love your people. Uh, but, um, but they can, sort of recategorize it as a sin if they call it idolatry and then sit, and label it Christian nationalism because that's what that is. Um, it's not biblical. This is not biblical at all. You can't find the Bible verses. Uh, so, th so they straw man it and they say, well, if you love the country, you must not love you, 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 your, your uh, eternal, your heavenly identity. You must have, you really love the country, you must not love that. And that's just a false dichotomy. It's just not true. It's just slander. I mean, that's all it is. Um, but that's, that's what we're seeing a lot of. So that, little bit on Southeastern there and what's going on. They haven't changed, uh, as far as I can see at least. I'm not seeing any about face. For the last few years, they've been on the woke train. They're continuing on the woke train. Uh, there's a few professors there who aren't, but, um, and, you know, and I, I would never say their names and I, uh, people who go there know who they are if they're, you know, if they're trying to stay away from that stuff, but, uh, it's they're they're being replaced, and this is kind of the direction of things right now in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, one thing, by the way, I forgot. I, I just saw it. Um, Time Magazine on the election, um, circling back to the election integrity issue. Time Magazine put something out that was really interesting uh, today. But let me just read this to you. Um, so here's some clips from this. It's the secret history of the shadow campaign that saved the 2020 election. Time Magazine, liberal publication. I'll, I'll read you a little clip from it. Uh, in a way, Trump was right. Can you imagine a liberal publication like Time saying Trump was right? Um, they talk about a well-funded cabal of powerful people ranging across industries and ideologies working behind the scenes to change the rules and laws and steer media coverage and control the flow of information. But they weren't rigging the election, it says. They were fortifying it. And they got states to change voting systems and laws. This is Time Magazine. I mean, they're saying everything but it's fraud. I mean, they're saying it's rigged. But trying not to, but but it was justified because they're fortifying it against Donald Trump's attacks on democracy. I mean, this, this is basically an admission. So I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, back to the uh, the SBC stuff a little bit, because I, I wanted to, we're entering now the practical side um, and some announcements. Uh, Randy Adams is one of the um, people running for president in the SBC, and I've seen some very clear indications that he wants audits done of uh, NAM and the IMB. And to be honest with you, that's where I, I've I've received more I think horror stories from the from NAM than I have from the ERLC. Uh, it's just that people I can't we we can't always get them out there because people will be fired. Um, NAM's a problem, and Randy Adams has a plan. And I don't know Randy personally. I've never met Randy. Um, 
I just want to encourage you to check into him if you're a Southern Baptist. I know there's another guy running who's also, um, I'm told at least, is a conservative named Mike Stone, but I have not seen anything from him that's specific about what his plans are. Um, I just, I, I don't know, and I, I can't. Um, encourage you one way or the other. I mean, look into them, but I, I don't. I, I've tried to find information out, and um, I, I can't find anything publicly available from him saying, "Here's the problem. Here's what I'm going to do." Randy Adams has that stuff right now, so maybe that'll change with Mike Stone. But here's the thing: um, whether it's Mike Stone or Randy Adams, I'm hoping you can get involved. Now, I don't know what Mike Stone has set up, but I do know. Uh, I just talked to someone the other day uh, who's um, trying to help Randy Adams get elected. Basically, his I mean campaign, you know, chairman, if you want to call him that, and he said, yeah, we could use volunteers, uh, people that can are good at. Uh, they want to put a website together. They'd like to have a film crew come out and do some stuff with Randy. Um, they're going to need probably some some volunteers to do other things, uh, some busy work. They're going to need uh, donations, of course, all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested at all in helping uh, Randy Adams out, if you, you you look into him and you say, okay, I want to. I'd like to, to do something in the Southern Baptist Convention, um, and um, I, I, look, I've said before, the SBC, in my opinion, it's I, I don't know if it's salvageable, but uh, it, it, to me, it doesn't seem like it can be. But if it can be, it seems like someone like Randy with a plan would be the person to do it. And I know many of you, you're dedicated to that. I would say, make this your last stand this year. Um, and just elect, it. you don't want to rearrange the furniture. It's going to have to be someone who's willing to apply stage four chemo uh, for stage four cancer. So um, go to the info section and there's some information there on who you can contact if you're interested in that. Don't contact me, I'm not the guy, but there is information on someone you can contact there. Um, I, I wanna say this, thank you for everyone who watched the interview I did with Judd Saul on equipping the persecuted in Nigeria. They've raised over $5,000 and I talked to him a few days ago, that's what he told me, uh, because of the video. So this is, the people in Nigeria are very grateful. This is going uh, to them, um, buying bulletproof vests and, and all, all sorts of aid and that kind of stuff. Um, also, we have someone on next week. Um, I should be able to get James White on uh, to do Romans 13. We're going to talk about that. But someone else is going to be coming on uh, who's a layman who just decided, you know what, I'm, I'm not, I didn't go to seminary, but I'm going to plant a church. There isn't one in my area, and I had to leave my church because it was woke. We're going to talk to him, and I want to encourage you guys through that. You know, you can do this, guys. Uh, you don't... Don't think that you have all these barriers you have to jump through that are required. You know, go go to what the Bible says about uh, being a righteous man, a faithful man, the uh, things required to be an elder, those kinds of things are what you need to be looking at more than the other stuff. Uh, and sometimes uh, necessity uh, requires it. You, you don't have the option of going to a, a good church in your area and you need one. Um, uh, other announcements. Um, we will be talking more about the vaccine and the masks and all of that coming up. Uh, by the way, I'm being shadow banned on Twitter. I wanted to mention this to everyone. You go in the info section, you will find a link to my Gab account. Gab is a social media platform. I also have some other social media platforms that are alternative, um, but uh, Twitter shadow banning me. And uh, I don't think I'm gonna be on Twitter much longer. So if you follow me on Twitter, um, you might want to get on Gab and follow me there um, or some of the other places that you can find me as well. Um, last but not least, let's read uh, Luke chapter 11, a par portion of it at least. Uh, and this is starting in verse, let's see. We'll start in verse 37, I guess. Um, now, when, when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him, and he went and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw this, he was surprised that Jesus had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, Now you, Pharisee, clean the house outside of the cup and the dish, but your inside is full of greed and wickedness. You foolish ones, did he who made the outside not make the inside also, but give that which is within as a charitable gift, and then all things are clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees, for you pay tithes of mint, rue, and every kind of garden herb, and yet you ignore justice in the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without rejecting the others. 
Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the seat of honor in the synagogue and personal greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unseen tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. And he goes on, and, and, we, and we could go on. I don't have time right now to go on. But here's the thing, guys. Um, I remember very distinctly when I was at Southeastern, I was very discouraged at the seminary that I was telling you about earlier. And I, I, that's where I had my MDiv from. I went um, to a wooded area when I was sort of in the middle of just being discouraged about what I was seeing on campus. And this, I, I turned to Luke 11 and I read and, it, and I realized that's who, this is who I'm dealing with. Uh, I'm not saying every professor there at all, but at that particular time, some of the professors that I was dealing with, that's and, and I couldn't figure out some of the conservative, more conservative professors. Why weren't they saying anything? Is it, could it be um, loving loving the seat of honor in the synagogue, and the personal greetings at the marketplace? Man, loving those things, guys. Be careful of that. Everyone likes to be complimented. Everyone likes to be honored. Be careful of loving it. I mean, he, he goes farther than calling anyone a Jezebel. He, he says they're unseen tombs. Tombs. Um, I mean, Jesus is really laying it down hard. Uh, he goes after their sense of proportion. Do you see that? You pay tithes of mint. You ignore justice and love. Isn't that what we're seeing in, in, in the evangelical industrial complex? Uh, so upset about, someone said the word Jezebel, or some, someone, um, one person wrote him this, this terrible letter. Okay, but they want to make federal cases out of these things. When look around you, look what's happening to your country. Look what's happening to your denomination. Look how, um, look how the, the pagans are, the, those, those who hate God are, are rejoicing. And, 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 the, and you're not talking about any of those issues. Isn't that what the Pharisees do? And, what, and, and the reason they do it, why do they do it? A fake righteousness, a fake holiness. I wouldn't use that word. I wouldn't do that thing. Okay, but, but you'll, you, you'll, you'll, you won't even look into the election integrity issue. You, you'll let you know, this whole transgender sports thing that doesn't seem to register with you. Um, what's... The, the massive censorship doesn't seem to be a problem for you. Like th those things, you know, aren't big deals. I mean, was it Christianity Today came out with an article, basically, <laughs> uh, kind of more or less going after or or, or putting the the um, people who were driving the GME stock up in a negative light. Christians really shouldn't be participating in that or some nonsense about that. That's not. It's not like following Jesus to do that or something like no one said it was. But like that's like they're, they're not addressing any of these things, any of the problems that are actually afflicting the people that these people are supposedly are trying to help. There's no interest there. Uh, forced vaccinations. Uh, how about what's coming down the pike? How about the fact that the government could ban certain currencies? Uh, the, I mean, this is happening in places like India right now. They just banned cryptocurrency. Um, the surveillance state, the spying. All, you don't have any concern about that. You don't want to find out what does the Bible say about our responsibility as citizens. You don't. No, no. You're you're upset. Someone said a, a word that you think is mean, and and this is um, th this is what's killing us. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did. They had no sense of moral proportion, and they look good on the outside. That's the virtue signal. I'm not racist. Look at all the things I'm doing. I'm retiring the Brodus gavel, J.D. Greer. Um, I'm going to change the name of the convention because it's more nice. I'm going to do all these things. But what are they inside? What are they inside? Are they helping? Are they actually addressing the things, speaking prophetically in the real sense to a culture that actually needs the Lord? And, and here's my final thought for you. What would that look like? You know, John, are you just complaining? What do you... No, no, I'm not just complaining. I'm trying to exercise some discernment here and I'm trying to just show you kind of in your just everyday reading of the Bible how these things just jump out and they apply. Um, here's what I would expect uh, of, of leaders. And maybe you're a leader that's listening or watching. Start thinking about where your people are at and what kind of questions they're asking and what kinds of things they need navigated, morally speaking, and what the Bible might say about those things and how you can instruct them on those things. And 
disregard whether or not it's going to hurt you or your reputation or take away some kind of honor. Who cares? That's what I would encourage you to do. Um, don't be selfishly cling to these to, to networks you're part of. Uh, you know, I'm part of this network. I'm uh, we're doing big things over here. I'm building this ministry or whatever. No, uh, those that's not going to matter in a few years, anyways. You realize that if things keep going the way they are, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I mean, I think maybe for me, I grew up in kind of a in in a very unchurched area in the Northeast, and for me, you know. I realize a lot of people in the Bible Belt tend to think like, oh, you know, being a pastor or something, that's a really honorable thing. Up there, it's like, people don't care. And, and we're, we're going that direction. People aren't going to care about your chief seat. Um, just serve God where you're at. You're, we're, we are slaves of Christ. We're, we're, nothing, we're not professionals. Um, to pick a title from a John Piper book, we're not professionals. And... and, and you know, maybe maybe some of your styles, uh, some of the styles of big evangelical leaders, has been more casual. But their attitudes aren't casual. They're they're they're, they're still think that they're they're I don't know. There's a there's a there's something there, guys, with a lot of these. I'm saying like 95 percent, I think, of the leaders of many of these big organizations. They're they're just um, there's a disconnect, guys. It's a massive disconnect. Uh, think about the books. Go go into like a bookstore. Even go on like CBD. Go go to uh, even Logos. See what Logos is pushing. I mean, they're pushing like woke hermeneutics right now. But go see what what's being what, what they're promoting at these places. Are books being written about the questions that you have? The questions that the Bible actually uh, gives us information on, or or is it just stuff that it's fluff? Um, so th that that's what I would encourage you to do. Actually, be practical. Go go. Uh, address the things that really do matter. And that's why I call my podcast conversations that matter. I do want to try to address the things that really matter, whether that's reporting, exposing, um, thinking through. Uh, th those are the things that I want to deal with. So anyway, uh, just a little thought for you on that. Hopefully, you know, we, we all have to be careful of that too. I mean, pride is, is something that uh, afflicts all of us on different levels, and I'm certainly not exempt from that. So you can pray for me with that as well. I, I don't... I don't want to, you know, you can get into the, the prideful state of like, I'm not like those people, those Pharisees, but then you become a Pharisee. And, uh, and I guard against that and I don't want that. And look, uh, ultimately, you know, we're supposed to be like Jesus. And how many of us are 100% like Jesus? No one. We're all striving for that, right? So um, anyway, uh, those are just some thoughts. Uh, I, I wanted to get that out this weekend uh, so you can think about some of these things and um, some of the practical things you can do. Uh, uh, if, if you're interested in helping out the Randy Adams campaign, go to the info section and you'll see uh, the contact info to, to get started with that. Hey, God bless you and, uh, and we'll see you on the other side of the weekend. Bye now.